Preview. Hey everybody, this is Birch. Uh, one of the things I see uh, quite frequently is this uh, this awful argument about female superhero characters and do they sell and do the publishers push them on you? Now, if you've been collecting comics or reading comics for any length of time, a long length of time, you, you know that Wonder Woman has been around forever and has a very long print run and uh, is, is a stable character. Um, I think, it, but, but it is true that female characters seem to have a tougher time of it in terms of getting a long run and getting sales together. I mean, even Wonder Woman, despite the fact that it's, uh, she's a legacy character, has had movies and all the rest, uh, sales have always kind of been, you know, mediocre. Now, now again, to be fair to that being fair, uh, Superman isn't much better. Superman has had uh, strong runs in, in his time as well. Um, equal to Wonder Woman, sometimes a little stronger. Uh, it usually evens out. Usually Wonder Woman sells a little worse than Superman, but they're in the same ballpark. Um, so it's, I don't think you can completely say it's, ah, it's a female male thing. But if you look over at Marvel, um, they have struggled to have a female character sell really well. Uh, yes, they have uh, put out Miss Marvel, they put out Captain Marvel, but neither of those titles have exactly burned up the charts. They, they have done really well when it's a number one or when it's a variant uh, kind of incentive book. But, but generally speaking, if you look at uh, Marvel over particularly the last 10 years, they have tried unsuccessfully to get a number of female superhero comics going, but they just haven't stuck. Now, why is that? Uh, I think the answer is, the, the, mo the biggest and most obvious answer you can get to by just looking into the past of the times when books like Wonder Woman did sell well. When George Perez was on the title, the book sold well. Even John Byrne's Wonder Woman run, which wasn't, uh, I, I don't know, it was not the, uh, it was not one that's well remembered in his overall portfolio, uh, it sold fairly well. So if you put a strong creative team on the book, it tends to sell better and you know newsflash and the, the longer you have the team on the book the better it sells over time and the more it holds its interest you know beyond once that creative team has moved on by the way that's a kind of an under talked about thing is if you have a very strong creative team on a book and you give them a long run and you you do it uninterrupted after they leave you get a kind of ripple effect of sales so people who started collecting comics during the period of that run will keep going for a pretty long length of time. And so, you know, all things said, if you put a strong creative team on, it will work. The, the bigger question I often have is why do publishers, when they say we want to push female superhero comics and we want to have them, you know, this is a priority for us. Why then does that stop when it comes to the creative, you know, creative team and specifically the artist? Uh, I think that you can certainly go within comic circles and say, look, Kelly Sue DeConnick was on Captain Marvel. Kelly Sue DeConnick is a, you know, a huge name. I would say, uh, not really. Again, if you're looking at sales, is she well-known? Uh, sort of. Again, not as well-known as I think people who are very close within comic circles believe. Uh, same thing with Gail Simone, by the way. Gail Simone has a very active fan base who like her and and she's very active on Twitter and everything else. But Gail Simone's name doesn't bring you know, the kind of sales that, say, a Scott Snyder does. Why is that? Well, I mean, I, two reasons. One, I think uh, Scott Snyder has had the benefit of being paired up with a Greg Capullo. And so when he's writing the book and his name's on it, he's had some pretty kind of mega artists with him. And that, that counts. Again, everything, when you attach things together that, uh, that are strong, it tends to grow the overall picture. And that's definitely something that uh, is true there. But the other thing is, you know, Snyder's had a long run. He's had, uh, he's been on, he was on Batman. He was on it for a long length of time. Batman is a big flagship character. You know, Gail Simone's on, you know, Birds of Prey or Batwoman. Uh, Batwoman is, is known, but doesn't have the same kind of presence as Batman. And so th that's why things, you know, work out the way they did. If you took a Gail Simone and you put Gail Simone teamed up with, you know, uh, <laughs> Art Adams for, I don't know, let's use somebody more. You put Gail Simone with Greg Capullo and you give, uh, give the two of them a, you know, four year, five year run on Batman. Gail Simone's going to become a superstar writer during that period. She's going to sell more. 
I, you know, obviously she needs to write a good story, but those factors are going to do a lot to kind of push the overall character. But I, why I go down this path is, again, you, you go back to female superhero books, and Marvel, more than DC, but kind of both companies, have become obsessed with, well, if we're going to have a female superhero, we better put a female writer on the book as well. Except you haven't built up any of those female writers. Most of them are relatively unknown. Yeah, you could say, you know, your, your Rainbow Rowles, your Mariko Tamaki, it's like they've done stuff in the YA market. Sure, but in comics, they don't have that reputation. And I'm not even going into whether they're good or bad writers. They just, they, they don't. It's a, it's a fact. So now you've got a lesser known writer, or at least a writer who isn't a big sales draw out the gate on a relatively new character or a book that you're trying to get off the ground. So that third leg of the stool is the artist. And, and here again, they're like, well, we better put a female artist on the book. Except who are the female artists that, that have you know, have a huge following. I like Colleen Doran very much. Um, Jen Bartel does, I, I like her covers. And, and but, but again, those names aren't bringing in mass sales in the store. So if you've set yourself up this way, you've got a relatively new character, like say you've got X-23 or, or uh, Laura Wolverine, um, or you've got the Wasp, or you've got, you know, any, you can go down the list of female characters at Marvel or DC have tried over the last, say, 10, 15 years. And, you know, not a lot of background, not a lot of, you know, information, other than Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn has done relatively well. Uh, but, but again, you look at Harley Quinn and you have Amanda Connor doing a lot of the art. Amanda Connor is a artist who draws attention. I think her name is, is known. Again, not known as, as high as, say, a John Byrne or George Perez, but still pretty well known. And the work looks mass market, mass sale. Well, what do you know? Harley Quinn is one of the successes of a female character over the last, uh, you know, 15 years or so. But for a lot of the others, they put relatively unknown, untested creative teams on it. And, and just to kind of cut the comments off the past, I'm not saying bad creative teams. That's, that's your decision. It's you, you can decide some of those creators, I think, are, are certainly better than others. No doubt about it. Well, my point here is they're not known. They don't bring in sales. They don't bring in readers just based on their name. So you get a relatively, you know, untested writer, relatively untested artist or un unknown. What's the word I'm looking for? Like un unknown to the market, which, uh, which again, Kelly Sue DeConnick, Kelly Sue has a name in comics, but it's not a mega superstar name. And if you put, those creative talents on a book with a relatively new character and then you launch it into the world, you're going to get lower results. Just, just right there, no matter what happens inside the pages, no matter if the creative team goes out and kills it and just works really hard and does the absolute best job they possibly can, you, you, that's what you're going to get, a pretty poor result. And then when you get a lower result, people don't buy it, then you get the, well, you know, this is why the comic audience are sexist or, you know, this just then the, the excuses come in. But the, the, the obvious answer is right in front of your face. You didn't staff it correctly. You didn't put you didn't set it up for success. Now, you look at some of the male titles and, and you see uh, they're, they're putting out a new book. It's like, oh, hey, we got Thor. Well, uh, we got Hulk. All right, well, let's get Donny Cates. He's probably the hottest name that Marvel has right now, and let's team him up with Ryan Otley, who's uh, coming off of, you know, Spider-Man and Invincible. And uh, that, yeah, what do you know? That title's gonna do, done, gonna do better. Mariko Tamaki, who is a female writer, of course, um, is doing better on Detective Comics. Well, big shock! Detective Comics is a strong selling title featuring Batman. And generally speaking, they've paired up Mariko Tabaki with bigger name artists, with people who, who draw more attention. And it works. Now, if you took Mariko Tabaki, you give, you know, you, you still need to push that run a little bit. DC's a mess. But if you gave Mariko Tabaki another two years or so on Batman, you keep the artist level really high. And then you take Mariko Tabaki and you put her on, um, Starfire. I, I don't know. I'm just pulling a, a DC female character out of out of my hat. You know, uh, Donna Troy. It's a comic, and you put Tamaki on it. You're gonna get a slight bump because of you. You spent the effort and the time in building up Tamaki. But but the, anyway, the, to me, this is all common sense. 
I think that female superheroes can absolutely sell. Uh, you again, yeah, George Perez, Wonder Woman did did quite well in sales. Omnibus sales have been very good. But Perez is a superstar artist. He's somebody who brings a lot of attention, a lot of credibility to the page because he's so good at what he does. So of course that's going to work. And that's that's really kind of the game. Um, I, I it, it is weird because this argument, everyone avoids the super, super obvious, which is, hey, you know, we, we need more female superheroes. Okay. Who are we going to put on it? These unknown creators. All right. That doesn't sell. Okay, well then, uh, that means the audience is sexist. It's like, <laughs> what? Wait, what? Wait. I mean, it just, it's just, it's a stupid path. And uh, it, it is to the detriment of a lot of pretty cool, there, there are a lot of really cool female superheroes out there, characters that you could do a lot with, that uh, I think you know lots of people would like to read stories of. I still think you could put a creative team on Storm and have a, you know, pretty strong thing. I know Claremont's name's a little older now, but you put Claremont on a storm book and you, uh, you don't set it in some weird period of the path where she's a kid. Uh, and you have, uh, you know, you need a really strong artist. This is where you need maybe your, uh, you know, your Pepe Larraz or your, uh, you know, somebody like that. Somebody who has the recent, uh, house of X powers of 10 kind of, you know, work uh, in their, in their belt. And, uh, you put that book out, and you make it, you know, don't try and deconstruct Storm. Don't reveal the secret of her past that she was actually never an orphan in Africa, but grew up in a privileged, you know, prep school in upper Manhattan. I mean, just don't do any of that nonsense. Just have it be a solid book. Um, you know, give her some big things to do. Have her, who knows, you know, give her, give her some major villains. Give her a good, solid plot. Off you go. That would be great. Um, but if you go out there and say, all right, we're going to take this, uh, this hero, we're going to put a writer. Nobody really knows. We're going to put an artist. Nobody really knows. We're going to be, you know, uncommittal about how many issues it is. We're going to call it an ongoing, but eh, nobody's really sure. And, um, oh, we're going to, uh, deconstruct the character. We're going to have her visit Wakanda and have lots of scenes of her looking kind of angry at black Panther and, and, uh, saying, you know, former husband, you should know your place. And then they're going to have some bickering and maybe some food. And then at some point, uh, some just people dressed up in kind of pajamas are going to come to try and steal something, but Storm will take care of it. And the next issue, we're going to have her fight some random alien on Araku that nobody's ever heard of before. But uh, she'll have some flashbacks to when she, you know, used to be afraid of tight spaces. and But then she'll win. And the next issue, she'll have a, an argument with Abigail Brand for the majority of the comic. And uh, then there'll be maybe some more aliens will kind of come to the ship. They'll get rid of those. And then in the next issue, uh, it's time for a guest star. So we'll bring in, I don't know, Bling, you know, that, that character Bling. And, and she'll be there and Storm will give her some advice. Like, that's what they do. And nobody buys that. You got to. You've got to set these characters up for success. It's, it's not rocket science. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, tell me if I'm crazy. And thanks for listening.